Welcome to this awesome roundtable experience. We've got Richard Harlman from over on the wild side who's joining us today. And uh, Richard has been on the channel before, and he talked to us about his background and his interests and things. And we just touched barely on his off-grid living. And this time, thank God he's coming back because he's actually going to talk to us more about the off-grid lifestyle, but also his approach to taking history and contemporary living, blending the two, and getting the, the most out of it. So, Richard, man, I appreciate you coming back on, brother. Hey, I'm glad to be here. So those of you who are joining us, uh, this is live, which is pretty cool. Uh, we're going to save all of the questions until the very, very end. And we'll leave about 15 minutes of that to, for you to answer anything that needs to be done. And uh, we appreciate any comments and questions that you guys have. Uh, that way I can field it with Richard. So Richard, getting started, man, getting started. Um, now, the last time we interviewed... You said you were into living history and in high school and then college and things like that. And we did a deep dive into that. But now at your point in life, you're taking history and you're blending it with contemporary lifestyle. I'm not saying you're living like a king with all the comforts of a home, but actually vice versa. You are taking the, the best parts of both world and blending them. What's your journey there? Like, how did you get started in that direction for those of us who may may not want to go all the way but at least start possibly figuring out a way to blend both oh uh well i always say simplification is the first step like uh minimizing simplifying that's uh reducing what we do is huge and took a long time for me to figure out because i i was probably worse than most I uh, envied a friend of mine who, when we were all, a bunch of us were living together as roommates and uh, we all had to move out. And one of my friends, he just had like a suitcase and a mattress. And I was so envious of him. That was years ago. It's taken me. I'm still trying to reduce down. I'd like to be able to just like live out of my car and be fine or like live out of my camp. But anyway, uh, that's my point. Um, mainly reducing it's amazing how much we think we need in normal life and then uh, little by little i've just been getting rid of more things like it just pop in my mind do i really need that and then i uh, uh not like i'm gonna try to go without it but then the challenge is presented in my mind and then i uh, pursue it and so uh, that's how it works for me i keep cutting more and more out of my life now, you used a key word there. You said challenge, and there's a, a theme in a lot of your videos on your channel that you you approach going outdoors as a challenge. Now, were you always adventurous like that? Uh, you know, I think so. To me, I'm just normal, but I've got enough feedback from people over the years that I guess uh, by some people's standards, I'm pretty adventurous. Some people have even said I'm, I have a lot of courage, and I've never accused myself of that. But, um, uh, yeah, I think when me and my, it was mainly my brother. I'm the youngest of three uh, kids, and my brother is the middle, and he's uh, about a year and a half older than me. And so he was the adventurous one. Uh, he always was coming up with ideas, and my, me and my friend would just do whatever my brother came up with. And, uh, Looking back, we did all kinds of crazy stuff, and uh, a lot of kids, I guess they didn't. Um, and so I don't know. Yeah, I guess I guess so. My dad was quite adventurous. <laughs> uh, so you've always been that way, or at least you you had a natural tendency for that. For so I am not all that adventurous, to be honest. Like I I have to have some type of motivation to get me there uh, what kind of suggestions would you have for someone like me to uh, help us push ourselves a little bit further maybe out of our comfort zone uh, that way we can experience things um, <laughs> that we may be a little bit hesitant to do now i, I give the viewers a, a few examples now 
you, you I've seen you start off light where oh, maybe not all that light, but it was in the early spring and you decided to try to transition yourself to the cold. So you dunked yourself in your long johns into your, your freezing Creek. And I remember a couple videos where you went out overnight and you're trying to figure out your bedding system and you're trying to figure out your tarp and tenting system. And it, it got down into single digits. So what suggestions would you have for someone who may not like want to go all the way there all at once, but to transition into that kind of direction so that they can challenge themselves and grow and improve themselves? Yeah, I believe in the baby steps. Like that's been huge for me as a sissy as that sounds. But, um, you know, okay, well, I like to say this. I used to watch outdoor videos, um, you know, recently when I was getting back into this lifestyle from my, anyway, uh, I'm sitting inside with a storm outside. I was inside my teepee, but I was nice and warm by a fire and plenty of firewood watching this guy doing videos thinking to myself, man, why don't I do that? And I couldn't barely get myself to go outside in the cold. And uh, <clears throat> and so then when I started thinking, okay, I am going to do this. I'm going to start making videos. There's that pressure that we get that we put on ourselves. I believe this is common, so I'm speaking to it, that, uh, that we believe we have to go out and do it the way that we see it done. Uh, you know, we see people, whether it's on videos or whether it's guys that we meet who brag about how great their um, camp life has always been all their life, how easy it is for them, which is a lot of bragging. But um, so we put all this pressure on ourselves that if we're not that, then we're not doing it right or that we're not man enough. Maybe we're not that blatantly, you know, calling ourselves out that blatantly. But, you know, we just feel like we don't add up. And so finally, I was. Um, I was sitting in my shed, my cabin, and um, I just kind of threw that off my shoulders and decided, you know what, I'm just going to do whatever I want. And uh, and that's why, like a couple of those camps that you mentioned, where they were just like a couple hundred yards off my property. And um, so that way, when I... I, I guess I did stay out on those the whole night, but I decided to myself, you know what? I'm just going to make coffee in the morning. I'm not going to cook breakfast. I'm just going to wake up, make coffee, and go home. And, um, you know, screw any any outside standards that I'm going to put on myself. And, um, I mean, we got to challenge ourselves, but it's okay to uh, do it little by little, I guess, point you know whether it's like there's a whole lot of people who can get in the water a lot better than i do and um and so it's kind of like that attitude of well i can't do what they're doing so i shouldn't even bother instead well i'm just doing it my way little by little and uh and we do, you just gotta tell yourself that's okay take control of your own life that's the beginning what's your approach to setting goals and uh, approaching those goals and achieving those goals. <laughs> Funny you should ask. I don't do that anymore. I quit. I grew up religious, and man, they like to put a lot of pressure on you. At least for me, that was my experience. Um, always, oh, you have to have goals. You have to have, um, you know, you have to meet this standard by this time in your life. And man, I wish I would have not uh, listened to all that. I don't set goals. I um, I have ideas and visions of what I would like. But um, the funny thing is, what I have found in my life is I don't know enough to know what's best for me. And so why am I going to set this goal when, like, let's say I set a goal for a year. Three months into it, I realized, you know what, that was a ill... Uh, ill-informed goal that I set and now I'm going to go off in this direction uh, so if I'm holding myself to that goal then I'm not freeing myself to go in the direction that I'm learning uh, so in other words 
every day I'm learning and growing more. And so why should I make a decision now that in the year I have to hold to when uh, in three months, I'm going to know a lot more than I know right now. Hope that's not too confusing. No, I don't think so. Um, would you say that your vision in a way, I, I, not to get into philosophy or anything, but would you say that your vision really is a goal? Like uh, you are wanting to acclimate yourself to cold weather. So that's a goal, right? And uh, you you baby stepped it. And like you said, I, I remember several videos. Uh, you're very honest with your viewers, which I, I love your integrity because you tell them straight up. Uh, especially at the end, like, well, I, I wasn't able to stay out this whole night because it got so cold or something happened to the dogs or the coyotes came around and I was afraid they were going to eat my horse or something. Um, but, you know, there's this, your vision, at least from your series that I've seen, uh, you, you did your baby steps and then you would alter it, right? So you still achieved your, your vision or goal. Would you say that those are about the same? Yeah, very similar. It's just that I've had training, like I did this personal development training when I was still a realtor and they were hyper-focused on goals. And so to me, there's a lot of baggage or I, I to me in the, the culture of goal setting, it's like something more specific where you set a goal and then you um, clarify steps that you're gonna take um, you know, many goals, many or um, smaller goals that set you up to achieve that goal, uh, where it's kind of a formal process. So that's kind of the difference that I'm making versus like, oh, hey, we got cold weather coming up. Um, and all of a sudden in my mind, I start thinking, hey, I could set up a tent. I, I could go out there and experiment with a tarp tent, make the best out of this. Um, yeah, I'm going to do that. And then I go out and, and try it. And, you know, if I, I mean, I was ready there. If it didn't work as well as it did on those first ones, I would have just given up and sat by the stove. Um, so it's more like just, hey, I could try this kind of an approach that I have. And um, rather than this is my goal, like in weightlifting, you know, that's very well known for you set goals. Like, I'm going to, my goal is, I don't even know the weight, uh, 800 pounds. So I'm going to start with um, benching my, or uh, I don't know, deadlift, I guess, my body weight. And then when I can do that, I'm going to increment 25 pounds or something. However, they do it. It's very much about goals versus, like I say, I just get an idea and go out and try it. I guess overall, I want to do cold acclimation, but I don't like say, but within two years, I want to be able to stand outside in zero degrees for 30 minutes. I mean, I don't, that, that kind of thing. I'd probably progress more if I did that. I got you. I think I understand. I, th I think we're speaking the same language. And there, there's definitely in the corporate world, this whole idea with like smart goals and everything's broken up and micromanaged and things like that. But, I, but I, I think I feel what you're saying. Your, your vision is what guides you. And uh, if you don't necessarily achieve your vision, it's not going to impact you in a negative way. Whereas a goal, because of the weight of it, you can feel like a failure. Am I putting words in your mouth? But is that kind of what you're saying? Like the weight of goals? Yeah, well, I don't want to. Yeah, I mean, there's probably some pressure about the about the failure. There's a lot of that kind of pressure. More of this comes from my philosophy of intuitive living that I'm working on, that I've seen lived out, and I'm that is a something that I'm trying to develop. So it's more like um, I think mainly the big difference is the freedom to be able to learn and adjust and course correct, you might call it, where, you know, tomorrow I'm gonna, this experience that I'm gonna do, so I, I get an idea in my mind, I go out and try it. Now I'm a new person from that experience. And so now I'm gonna have a new, um, I'm gonna have 
more experience to make my next move, which I didn't have when I started and might have made my goal. So I have to stick rigidly to that goal um, because I set it up as a goal rather than, hey, tomorrow, the experiences I go through today make me a new person tomorrow. And therefore, tomorrow I know better about the next direction to take than I do right now. All right. I think I got you. So let's uh, switch gears a little bit. Your vision of his historical camping, historical adventure mixed with contemporary camping and contemporary outdoor adventure, uh, where do you find the balance between those two? Uh, still finding it, I guess. So the historical, I guess what you could say what limits me on the historical is uh, time and money. I guess the, the reigning principle in my life is simplicity and efficiency. And the Victorian times were not that. They were actually opposite that. Uh, Mark Twain called it the Gilded Age. Uh, and, you know, Gilded is kind of like Las Vegas, where things are for show. You can go down there and see incredibly impressive looking buildings. But then when you find out how they're made, they're just. Um, they're like a Hollywood set, essentially, not not quite as um, simplistic as that. But, you know, the Gilded Age, it was very phony, but very elaborate and uh, showy. And uh, so that's where me, my personal um, convictions and my Old West passion kind of diverge at that point, because um, I'm not into the Victorian philosophy although I do love a lot of the aesthetic, obviously. But um, so I guess, and that's kind of what I'm dealing with right now. Like the historical has been incredible for me to focus and, and to have kind of a, a guide, a vision uh, and a guide to guide me and keep me focused. Um, but now that I've been doing it for a long time, I, like I say, I find ways to simplify my life that kind of diverges from that, uh, like clothing. Like uh, clothing is a great example. The um, the old west clothing is Victorian era clothing, which is very complicated, very showy, and the best example that I have is the vest. So like these modern vests, even though it's like an old west style but it's a modern vest. It's the same material front and back. And I like that. It's consistent. Uh, and if it was wool, I've got a wool vest that's modern and it's wool all the way around. Whereas Victorian era, the vest was just for dress. And so the front was wool and then the back is paper thin cotton. And that was really annoying on one of my recent camp trips because I was really cold and I could feel it on my back. And so that kind of thing, I, I just don't like that. I love it as far as like the aesthetic and I appreciate Victorian era, um, but that's just a great example of how like the clothing and I, we kind of diverge there. Okay, so actually you you beat me to the punch. I was gonna ask you about clothing. Well, why did you, uh, why, why do you consistently dress like this? If this was an aesthetic or if there is, actual benefits from it for you so could could you explain the benefits yeah for sure so yeah that was an example of like true as uh true victorian era clothing um as far as like this is like my modern this might not look modern to other people but this is modern um i'm planning to go to town tomorrow and this is basically how i dress like wool i love natural fibers and obviously back then they had natural fibers. I don't believe they had any polyester yet. Um, but uh, so I love wearing wool, natural fibers. I love um, I love this. I love the look of them. I love the pockets and the practicality, especially if you're in your car or on a horse and you got your stuff in your pockets. Um, and uh, bandana is great. It keeps a shirt expensive and hard to come by when you got a nice one and uh, the neck gets dirty really fast. 
So wearing a bandana is a practical uh, thing for that. It's also warmer. And if I get if I get warm, then uh, while I'm wearing it, I can loosen it up so it's not quite so tight. And uh, a lot of people say that there's a lot of practical purposes to wearing a bandana, but I wear one every day. I rarely ever use it for anything besides um, besides just being warm and keeping my collar off my off the grease of my pinky neck. Uh, I've tried getting it wet and keeping me cool, you know, that way, but I, that's more of an old life. So, so your off-grid life, you, you've got a, a couple animals around your, your farm, or, or I don't know if it's a farm, if I could call it that, but you've got a couple animals that's everywhere. And uh, you last year, might have been the year before, but I think it was last year, where, again, you did a series on meat preservation. Now, did you originate that idea out of necessity or was it an idea from something that you learn again from history or is this more of a contemporary thing to deal with the the off-grid living lifestyle that you you're trying to accomplish oh yeah so mostly that was just me wanting to be simple and um and so getting rid of refrigeration means how am i going to deal with this meat and uh drying is the easiest way i'm in a very arid climate so drying is very easy to do and easy to store uh and then as i was doing that then i ran across references like uh one guy can't remember who wrote it but they were traveling across the uh, i think on the oregon trail and he talked about how uh, out there they could keep meat fresh for months or weeks six weeks maybe it was two months um where you know back east and in most of europe especially england where a lot of our people uh came from uh it's very humid and so uh, back east so they have to do things like uh, dry aging where they grow a protective mold on it to keep it from going bad and um and stuff like that so when they came out here they started to notice that the meat just stays good. And, but that wasn't like what gave me the vision. It was more that I was just trying to preserve meat. And I've watched Townsend's and all of his techniques are originated back east, like I said, in mid Europe. And um, so they're very laborious, intensive. I tried to do salt for a while, but then you got to buy something. And so I'm trying to cut out everything that I can, that, that I have to buy. So again, that's why I went to drying. And um, and so, yeah, the techniques out here are just different from what they did back east. So it was more out of wanting to live a simple lifestyle, but that happens to fit in with, well, actually, I haven't run across a lot of references of people using dried meat, to be honest. Um, I don't know that it's actually, a, I might be making my own reactorism with that. When you, or actually, what is your process when you, the me thing was just happenstance, it sounds like, like it was just accidental. When you live out in the middle of nowhere and you're trying to live this simplistic life and you have some guiding principles, can you tell us where some of those guiding principles come from and how we could possibly utilize some of those guiding principles in our lives to simplify it, but especially in the outdoor adventure world what are some tools that you've learned or methods that you've learned uh, for processing information or guiding the direction that you want to go with your lifestyle oh that's a tough question to answer it's a good question but it's a tough one to answer um i think that uh my main one is that uh i crave simplicity and efficiency and so uh, I guess, okay, so there, there's this book that I've got that I love to tell people about. There was a guy that one of the first of three white men to come to my valley, uh, and he wrote about his travels. And um, somehow when I was reading about it, he did things like when he was young, because he came here when he was like, 18 or 19 or 
20 because he came with his older brother and another guy. And um, and he did things that were just, uh, you know, kind of silly. Like he, he wanted to go to a dance and it was a, a two, two days ride and it was a New Year's Eve dance. So, you know, the dead of winter into the mountain. Well, he started feeling lonely and decided like last minute, hey, I want to go to that dance. So he made it in the day. He forgot to take a coat. And he forgot. Uh, <laughs> and so, um, and he rushed and he made it to the dance and he was frozen, but he was really glad he went. And it's a great story to read about. And uh, so that, that, I give that as an example of how a lot of his uh, travels were. Obviously, I think eventually he got uh, a lot more competent. But he did a lot of that kind of stuff. And I'd read about that thinking, man, he's not encumbered like we are. You know, I, I got into back camping, uh, backpack camping when I lived in Seattle. I'll always be grateful to my friend who got me into that. But nonetheless, if I remember right, my pack was 55 pounds. And I just think back to that and think, my goodness, I could have done that with probably 20 pounds or 25 pounds. Um, so I guess that created the, the vision or the idea. And um, I think it's a lot of that's just my propensity towards simplicity and um, my um, craving for simplicity. And so the, that's kind of the thing that guides me. And, um, and so when I go out, it's on my mind, I guess, I'm just always challenging, do I actually need that? Uh, like, there's so much talk about axes and yet, I've done most of my back uh, my camping without an axe, because usually, if you can't break it with your leg for firewood, you can just drag it onto the fire and just keep shoving it in. So you don't need anything to cut firewood. Honestly, most of my camp trips, I don't even use my knife. Um, no way I'm going to go without a knife, though. But um, I just don't get a lot of the the camping mentality of having all this crap that you don't use. And funny enough, somebody even made fun of me on a comment somewhere saying, oh, this guy doesn't even carry an axe or tools. Um, I don't want to watch him. Well, okay, that's fine. Go watch the guys that are weighed down with a bunch of stuff that they don't really even need. It's kind of funny that bushcraft, I love bushcraft. I like the idea of it, but it's just once you carry a tarp, all of a sudden, all that, almost all that goes out the door. I mean, you, you gather firewood with your hands, you set up a shelter with a tarp, cut one stick for the pole or a couple sticks, and uh, bring your cooking equipment. And then bushcraft, then at that point, is really just for fun. I mean, I didn't get into it that way. It's just kind of what I discovered along the way. Uh, also, maybe I'm kind of lazy in that guy. I hope that answers what you're asking. <laughs> yeah, that was actually a great answer. That was a great answer. I I am one of those guys, I think, who overpack even today. This mentality of you always have to be prepared. It's always with me. And I struggle sometimes, especially going by myself. Now, in scouting, you got the buddy system. I know you do a lot of, uh, you, like all of your camping is pretty much alone with some dogs. And I know you're, you're actually trying to, or you were, I think, trying to, teach your dogs how to carry some of your weight if i remember right is that right i might have mentioned it years ago but no i haven't really mentioned that okay but um i, I was just frustrated though <laughs> so uh so in scouting you're supposed to have like a buddy system and when i have camp when i'm camping with a buddy like not both of us don't really need a large first aid kit so we, we can like break up the weight and it certainly makes it easier going individual when I'm actually doing like a, an overnight hike or a day hike by myself when I'm just doing training, I, I tend to overpack because I don't have that buddy with me who's uh, loaded down. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a constant struggle. So this, this leads me to my other question, vintage gear versus contemporary gear. 
in all honesty, if you besides your experimentation, what do you actually prefer, vintage gear or or contemporary gear? Yeah, good one. Um, let's see. I got this. This one's a great example. So this is a stainless steel coffee pot, but it's kind of pretty much uh, designed like an old tin one. And um, that's one that I'd love to use tin. And eventually, if I come into some money, I'll get a good tin setup. I mean, I get I have a bigger one, but that's my small personal one for for trips. And um, stainless steel just makes so much sense. I mean, there's certain things that we've developed that you just can't beat. And stainless steel, I mean, you can beat it with titanium, I suppose. I, I don't have any titanium stuff, but from what I understand, it's just as heat resistant and it's uh, lighter weight and just as durable from my understanding. And so, but the point is, none of the old stuff competes with um, with stainless steel because uh, you can just put it right in the fire, right on coals. I've ruined a couple of uh, tin pots because I don't have firewood that creates coals around here. Uh, that's something I mention fairly regularly. And so, all I can do is cook over an open flame. And uh, some people say they cook over a flame, but as far away as I'd have to put it and then wait an hour for it to boil, that's just not my thing. Uh, I'd rather it boils in five minutes and I can do that with the pan uh, with stainless steel. So as soon as I can, if you can set it right in the coals, then all of a sudden your cooking gear is reduced. You don't have to hardly bring anything. Um, same goes with, at this point, my, um, my actual fire setup is uh, a grate. Uh, I don't have the perfect one. I want to get one that's about two and a half or three inches wide by about eight to ten inches long. Um, eight, eight is my plan because I'm going to make a bag where it fits in sideways. So just three by eight because you can always find rocks. And if you can't find rocks, you can find green wood. Uh, and if you don't want to use green wood, you can also usually just dig out or build up a mound of dirt, mound of dirt, and then lay that grate across. And now you got something to hold um, your pot off of the fire because it's got to have air. If you put it right on the coals, then a lot of times you push it out because it snuffs it out essentially or it keeps it from burning really well. So that's my, um, that's my, that's what I've reduced my setup to. It went from, I don't have it handy, but a fold up one. It's a modern, Thing. It's eight bucks, but it folds up so you can uh, put a fire under it and have a grate. But then I started to realize I don't even need that. I only need that grate. And a little bit wider would be nice in case I can't find perfect rocks that are flat. Um, and I need a little bit more of a span. Because I've also learned that uh, the quickest, the easiest way is to just cook with twigs, uh, unless I'm trying to cook for. Uh, unless I'm trying to heat myself, but just cook. Um, just cooking with twigs is excellent. I did it all year in 2022. Well, I say all year. The whole year that I lived outside um, in between the rainy season, I cooked uh, right through the summer, even when it was 100 degrees out. Um, and I figured that out. So my point is that's two examples of um, where it's so simple to use modern metal that uh, I want to do it. Now, here's a funny one. Okay, on the other end of things, I'm setting up a uh, modern, I was setting up a modern camp set that I could go super minimal uh, because I got a sleeping bag. My sleeping bag is a zero down bag. I've used it a ton of times. It's an excellent bag. It weighs, I think, four pounds, maybe three and a half. And um, and then um, oh shoot, what was I going to say? Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was going to get a modern tarp where my canvas tarp weighs about five pounds. It's a seven by eight, and I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to go on this ultra light 
kit that I want to set up and uh, with my sleeping bag. And then I'm going to get a, a really light um, tarp. I think they weigh one and a half pounds or two pounds for a, a I forget all the terminology, um, poly sill. They got some word for it. But anyway, what I found out was they are not good for fires, but they get holes in them really easy. And so that's where, by thinking it over, looking it over, I decided not to go with a modern tarp, even though it would save me three pounds, because it's too important to me to have that fire right at my entrance, as you can see in a lot of my thumbnail. Uh, because um, it's so easy to stay warm, setting up some uh, some slanted version of a tarp tent and then the fire right in front of me. And uh, when I do that correctly, I can be in a t-shirt in 30 degree weather. But if I have a tarp where I can't get, where it gets holes in it way too easy from fire, then I'm not gonna take that risk. So that's where I've decided, in my opinion, um, uh, the canvas tarp makes more sense. So uh, more of the old fashioned in that regard to me takes over. Same with the clothes as far as like the natural material. I'll take this over wearing plastic clothes uh, any day. So that's there's probably some other examples. But that's what I could think of right now. What about how to carry the load? I know you have tried many different methods and in your videos you from packing it on your horse but also packing up your tarp and everything and making a bundle and using rope straps throw that over your shoulders and everything uh for your preference and maybe for someone who's starting out and this might seem kind of obvious but there we started at the, this episode at the very beginning talking about aesthetics there's there's an appeal for uh, historical camping or traditional camping so sometimes we make sacrifices for that aesthetic but uh, based off of your experiences, would you do you honestly prefer to take your canvas tarp in a, a bundle or some other method and using maybe even a historical traditional pack setup? Or do you actually prefer more of like a, a modern pack setup with either an internal or external frame? Yeah, that's a good one. So I when I did my backpacking, I had a sweet pack. My first pack was good, and then I got a really nice one at the REI yard sale, by the way. We camped out for those. And um, and so I have respect for those. Uh, like, they enabled me to carry that 55, 50, 55 pounds uh, really well. So there's a lot of reason for those packs, and they're very advanced. If you know how to um, shape them, you can shape it right to your back. And it's got that great uh, waist and the chest hooks. But the, pro the thing is, those are wonderful when you're carrying 50 pounds, um, which, as I've already mentioned, for uh, overnight now, I haven't done it with my sleeping bag yet. No, I haven't done it with my sleeping bag yet. I don't know why I didn't. but. Um, I think I could do about 20 pounds and have enough food for a few days. So at that point, it's like, well, I don't need that pack. It's overkill. I don't need a, whatever they weigh, five pounds, five pound pack to carry my 20 pounds. Um, now, however, because I was using wool blankets, when I've tried to do my a pack, it's way too bulky with wool blankets. So if I do it with a sleeping bag, I think that that pack design I'm using where I just pack it in my tarp would work well if I got good shoulder straps and then um, and then set it up well to tie it around my waist because that waist support is huge for comfort. Now, that being said, for those who don't know, primarily I set up for horseback. So it's less important. But if I was going to continue going that route of having a solo uh, option, which actually I am working on that, I got an old horse sense 
I've got like six of them. And so I grabbed one. It's got a buckle on each end, and then it's this nice wide uh, mohair. And so it's really soft on the shoulder. So I grabbed one of those, and I'm going to, I want to set up a, a, a binding system where I can wrap my gear in a tarp with my modern sleeping bag and carry it on my side with that strap over my shoulder and see how that works. And if it's too heavy, or if I want to go with more weight, then I want to do two of them. Uh, so yes, I would still, I still want to get the pack down. If people are really into um, wanting to do it old fashioned style though, that don't want to but want to be a little more comfortable, there is that, uh, there's a lot of people who use the uh, basket. They're, they're shaped uh, like three feet by a foot and a half or so. Um, so it's a basket and it's got straps and it's a good setup that a lot of people use. So there is that option that apparently is historical. I think that was more of an East Coast thing for the um, for those guys. What would be your loadout, uh, your hypothetical loadout for someone who really doesn't have a whole lot of historic stuff, uh, but they're maybe wanting to go in that kind of direction to experience traditional camping, whether it be early 20th or you know, late 19th century? What, what kind of suggestions that you would have with what, modern equivalents so that they could kind of get the feel and see if they really want to completely commit financially and everything else in that direction? Yeah, good question. So this pot that I showed you guys, this coffee pot, it's only 15 bucks. And I love the look of it. To me, it's important what I got sitting around. Um, so it's $15. It's lightweight. You can, uh, in my opinion, I prefer to not carry a filter that way because I, I got plenty there. I can boil water and then let it cool and drink it. Um, also, a 10 cup is uh, super cool, and you can get these for uh, less than 10 bucks, I think. So, the cookware um, is a good one to start with because that's a big part of your camping experience is cooking food. And so, um, that's a cheap way to do a lot of it. But then um, the pans are really expensive. So, just get a Say just a lightweight pan because I mean you could carry a small cast iron but they're so damn heavy. Um, you know I take that back. If somebody's really committed, there is a later style. I believe they were 1870s. It's, they call them cold handle because they um, they had a different handle design, but it's still the sheet iron. So it's way lighter than uh, cast iron, and it's not that heavy. And you can find those in antique stores sometimes or uh, online, and they're still pretty cheap. So a couple items of cook gear, and then minimize. You can just take a spoon. You don't have to have a spoon, fork, and a knife. You should have a knife on you anyway. You just get over the grossness of uh, using it for everything. Because as long as you, all right, I shouldn't be giving safety tips. Anyway, uh, uh, so yeah, coffee pot and a and a pan and a cup and a spoon. I think that pretty much makes up a, a cook set. And uh, I guess you would need a, some kind of a. Well, it depends on what food you're taking, but um, that pretty much covers the bulk of your gear. Because if you're not cooking, you're gathering firewood. If you're not gathering firewood or cooking, then you're probably sleeping or setting up your shelter. Uh, so a canvas tent is another good one. I would go nine by nine. I've done the eight by seven for a long time. Unless you know it's going to be fair weather, then or if you're only five and a half feet tall, that might help too. Then you could do seven by eight, seven by seven, which is nice because it cuts down on the weight. But it's kind of hard to get into a canvas tarp really cheap. But a tarp tent is so useful. That might be one that somebody 
is willing to invest if they're committed to camping, then a tarp tent can work as a way. Do you really think that a tent is even really necessary for someone who's beginning? Uh, I, I think people that actually Sarge Vining, he said it in one of the earlier videos that I did that we tend to pack our fears. And uh, I've heard that before. And I think a lot of people feel like they have to have a tent because it's kind of like your fort. <laughs> it protects you from, you know, the wild bear that's going to come along and, and gobble you up or something. Um, and out West where you live, honestly, you, you do have more concerns than what I have here in Ohio because you, you, you've got a lot of crazy big animals out West. Uh, here in Ohio, we're just starting to see some bobcats and some black bear, uh, but, but none of the concerns that you, you really have. So I, I guess it uh, kind of depends on regionality, but for the beginning person, do you think a tent is really all that necessary? Uh, well, yeah, first, I mean, to be clear, when I say tent, I mean a tarp. And uh, we've already talked about um, my, uh, what was I saying? Well, so yes, to me, a tarp is essential because you don't want to get caught out in the rain. Now, that being said, when it's fair weather, I don't even set up a tarp tent. Like if it's getting down into the 30s at night, and if it's dry, uh, high humidity, then I won't even set it up. I'll just um, lay it down on the ground because it is good to always have a layer of um, protection, dampness from the ground to your bed, and then in the odd chance that it rains, if you're not expecting it, it's easy to fold it over and now you're safe. So that's why to me, it'd be silly to go without a tent, um, without a tarp, I mean. But yeah, definitely don't set it up if you don't need to. I mean, uh, I, I prefer when I don't have to. I like the simplicity. But uh, yeah, I can't imagine anyone going out, especially alone, without a tarp. But I also, I pack my stuff in the tarp. And then, like I said, I use it to sit on and sleep on and to keep that dampness. So really, it has multiple uses. Uh, since, like you said, it's just, it's a tarp. It's a, it's a square or rectangular cloth. And you can use it for lots of different things. So, and that, that end, it has multiple uses. Do you think that you present actually an inaccurate uh, loadout? I say loadout, and I'm not talking about like cotton shirt or anything like that, but I mean just uh, an inaccurate loadout of, say, a cowboy, someone who's living out uh, on the prairie with their horse. Or do you think actually you live a pretty accurate lifestyle? Live or camp? Uh, camp. Let's, let's stay with camping. Uh, <laughs> Good question. Yeah. I mean, it's varied. I did have a tin. I had a tin uh, coffee pot there for a while. And I've done some camps that were pretty dang close. But I mean, it depends on how accurate a person is. Like for a lot of people would assume that what I've got is correct. But I mm -hmm. look at things like, okay, that rope isn't the right braided design that they would have done back then. Even though it's a, you know, it's a non-synthetic rope, it's not the right kind. So right. Something like that. To me, um, uh, my clothing isn't up to where I want it. My boots aren't correct. But 99%, not 99, 90% of the people wouldn't know that. But I always mention it so more people are learning. What about just the gear that you actually take out camping? Um, I'm not talking about again, like the authentic. But do you does the average cowboy who's out on the range or maybe traveling from one town to the next town or something do would they really carry a whole lot of stuff anyways? Would they be carrying uh, kerosene lanterns or would they be carrying a bunch of odds and ends or would they try to live pretty Spartan? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, that's kind of neither. So okay. that's. Excellent question. Uh, no, there's not a lot of cases of 
people doing what I'm doing. So I referenced that guy that lived in my valley. Mm -hmm. He would take springs up to Canada and up north to miners to supply miners and make money uh, by selling all the, he'd buy stuff in the Dells, Oregon, and then he'd haul it up, you know, 15, 20 mules in a string and uh, sell it. That was a way to make money back then. Um, unfortunately, he never says what he's what he camps with. It's very frustrating to me. The best I've got are those examples I gave where he didn't have anything, and uh, and he just suffered. Those are the ones that make it into the book because they're the interesting stories. The one time that he said anything was that uh, it was a couple decades into it, so there was a train. And he left his camp kit with the one guy, and he went and took the train back. So all I know is that he had a camp kit at one time. What that was composed of, I don't know. Granted, now, another example, I've got two accounts, two separate accounts of guys who traveled over the Natchez Pass. It was at the time... It was probably the main pass for thousands of years for the uh, Indians. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the white people who settled here, they only used it for a little while until Snoqualmie, our main pass, got uh, opened up. But um, Natchez Pass posed problems for wagons, as in they had to roll them by rope. Uh, but on horseback, it was more doable. Anyway, I've got two first-hand accounts on those trips, and uh so excited because one or both guys uh went into detail with what they had and uh so that was incredible um one guy even mentioned the color of his blanket and so eventually someday i want to re replicate that because that's the one thing i've got um but i mean really okay sorry i, I got up on there's other parts that i want to address here like charlie seringo He's a guy who did do quite a lot of traveling because of his position in the ranch. Uh, it, 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 you, it meant he traveled a lot. But in reality, most of these people were a day or two away from a town. And what they would do mostly was just stay at a town. I don't think it was like now. I don't know enough about prices. But like for me to travel and just take a hotel is dang expensive. Right, but back then I think it was like twenty-five cents or fifty cents for a hotel. Maybe it was a dollar. In other words, I think it was a much smaller percentage of your um, income. I think that a room, because a lot of times you didn't get a room. Sometimes, depending on where you were and what era, what what which time frame, a lot of times they would um, they would just push the tables and chairs back in the saloon. And all the guys would just sleep on the floor, and you paid paid for that. And so there wasn't nearly as much camping as I thought when I got into this. You know, I was inspired by movies. And right, right. I think we all are. Yeah, and then you learn the real history, and it's often boring. <laughs> uh, so I don't know. There's not a lot of examples of guys who actually lived, went and did trips like I do. I have an extra benefit too that I didn't expect, like. My lifestyle is so um, close to camping to begin with that that need to get out and camp, which is very real, I don't have anymore because I kind of just live it mostly. And so, um, so I sympathize with people who need to get out and camp and don't have any choice but to go where there's mosquitoes. They don't necessarily have that for you, have that that I have. So that poses that, that brings up two questions I have. Um, those of you who don't know, Richard's actually a comedian as well. He goes on the road and he he's a comic and he's pretty good at it too. Uh, you posted at one point where they were giving you a hotel and you decided to to not use the hotel because you prefer more of a Spartan lifestyle. Why is that? What what happened? I also didn't take the free steak dinner either. Oh my gosh, that's that's a sin. All right, we're no longer friends, Richard. <laughs> well, <laughs> when you live the natural life, you're really living. 
and uh, and it really like it's more like a frog in the water. I didn't know it until you go back to civilization. The food is bland. Uh, you know, they raise food for profit, not for taste. Right. And so you're you're eating this this food. I'm very against commercial um, food industry and the commercial meat industry. I've tasted like people tend to say you don't eat ram, you don't eat bull, but these grass-fed animals that are living a good life out in the pasture with other animals, they're, they're living a good life. They're eating grass. They taste amazing. Uh, uh, it does. You're, you're yeah, right, and, man. And so why do I want to... These days, I eat so little food, I don't want to put food that's not the best in my body. And uh, so it just had no appeal to me. Oh, yeah, and then with the hotel, it's like my dogs are outside because uh, I didn't want to pay $35 each to bring them in. And uh, there's no no airflow. Um, the mattress, I, I like my mattress. I like my pillow, even though I brought my pillows in. I like my down comforters. Like all that stuff is designed for profit. Like the hotel can't buy nice stuff because right. then it wears out and then they got to keep replacing it. And so why do I want to go in and spend the uncomfortable night when I've got what I love right outside? The second question I have from your, your previous comment was, has your life, the way you're living it and everything, has it kind of actually ruined the taste of camping for you? Or is it just an extension? Yeah, that's kind of what I was saying. Yeah, it kind of has because um, I love where I am. I go out, um, I've got to the point in my life, when I was younger, like in my teens, we would go do reenacting. I didn't care if I was sleeping on the ground. I, I loved it, in fact, because the more um, rigorous I could make my life, the more I felt like I was living up to uh, my forefathers, you know? Right. But now, yeah, now I'm at this place where I want a good, good night's sleep, and... Uh, you know, it makes a difference. And so my mattress is super comfortable. I've got my two feather uh, down comforters. I mean, guys, get down comforters. Your life will change. You can get them for 25, 50 bucks on Marketplace. And uh, there's nothing like them. And, uh, and so I go out camping. It used to be camping. You get away in nature. And you're like, oh, I don't want to leave. I don't want to go back. Right, right. Now, yeah, like, well, why am I doing that when my horses, my dogs, and me would all be more happy back home? <laughs> <laughs> Does any of that have to do with age, you think? I, it, yeah, that's the question. <laughs> Funny. But, because there is still, there, there's a little bit of that desire to get out and see what's around the corner, around the bend. And I hope to do that this year. I want to go out a week just right off my property and then see if some of that adventure comes back to me. <laughs> I hope it does. And Richard, I, I appreciate you giving us your time, man, for us to pick your brain. I know out where you live, uh, it's, it looks like it's still sunshine out where you live. Yeah, it is 939 where I live here in Ohio. So it is, we got the moon peaking. <laughs> it's funny how uh, the world works. And it's awesome that we can do this in today's society with today's technology, man. Um, yeah. But I appreciate you coming on and talking to us about your experiences. You've given us some really good uh, nuggets of information. And those of you who are unfamiliar with Over on the Wild Side, check out his YouTube channel. He's got a lot of great videos on there. The guy well, walks the walk, talks the talk, and he's very honest. As Richard says, there's a lot of YouTubers out there uh, who they portray something, but it's not really the reality. It's uh, been doctored up and everything. But Richard's very honest. If he doesn't sleep out overnight and negative degree, yeah, he, he tells you. He's like, no, I'm, I'm not stupid. I'm not going to kill myself for you two. <laughs> And nor would I, nor would I. Um, so if you want somebody with some integrity, uh, go check that out. He's got some really...
really good stuff. He's also a comic, so make sure to check out Richard Harleman uh, and check out some of his shows and stuff. He's making the rounds and everything, and now he's getting offered steak dinners and hotels, so you know he's moving on up. So you get to check him out early, and you can say that you saw him at the beginning. Richard, do you have any last words before we uh, wish them all good night? Uh, Richard Bisbee, go and like my um, like my uh, Substack post. <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to write about uh, the difference of mindset that I have now versus civilization, and that's on Substack. So I like to talk about that. Everything that I do is over on the wild side. So if you want to find me on Instagram or Facebook or um, or YouTube, it's all over on the wild side. Uh, so. There. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> awesome, guys. Well, thank you so much again. Uh, make sure to check out the traditional Camp Crafters Guild because we have these bi-weekly live roundtables where we have the opportunity for you guys to ask questions and stuff and uh, some other uh, events and things that's just exclusive for the Camp Crafters Guild. So, Richard, I thank you so much for doing this for us. I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Give a kiss note to your loved ones, and we will talk to you guys later. Take care. <laughs>